Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar titled Novel Methods for the Development of Stem Cell Derived 2D and 3D Models. My name is Georgina Wynne Hughes, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I'm delighted to be joined by our guest speakers, Dr. Erin Nock, Associate Director of Neurobiology at Stem Cell Technologies, and Dr. Jessica Hartman, Senior Director of Product Applications at Cell Microsystems. In this webinar, Dr. Erin Nock will describe how to culture and differentiate choroid plexus organoids derived from HPSCs and how they can be applied to answer specific research questions. Dr. Jessica Hartman will discuss improving workflows that span the breadth of IPSC biology, from reprogramming to monoclonal edited colony formation to 3D models for disease. After the presentation, we will have time for a short question and answer session. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit these at any time in the box to the right of your screen. Without further delay, I'd like to hand over to our speakers and I would like to thank them again for presenting for us today. I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today to hear about novel methods for the culture and development of stem cell uh, derived 2D and 3D models. And I'm thrilled to be joined by my colleague from Stem Cell Technologies, Erin. And we're going to tell you a lot today about how you can use these pluripotent uh, derived models to ad advance your scientific research. So some key learning objectives from our webinar today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk to you about a protocol to help get the desired clones that you need in the shortest time possible with demonstrated savings of reagents, media, plastic, and most importantly, time. We're going to talk about using pluripotent stem cell derived models to model human health development and disease. And Erin's going to talk to you about the differentiation and characterization of these pluripotent stem cell derived choroid plexus organoids in more detail during her portion of the talk. So if you're joining us today, I'm sure that you are very familiar with the complexities of induced pluripotent stem cell culture. And if you've ever looked down a microscope and seen something like this, uh, you're well aware of the pain points that can be involved in doing this type of workflow. So first and foremost, uh, one of the main challenges with IPSC development is poor viability. And that's why we really rely on all these quality reagents that Erin's going to tell you about, because this is sort of the number one issue that people face in the lab. Because of these poor viability issues, this leads to inefficiencies in your workflow. There's often difficulties in proving monoclonality because the cells don't survive well at single cell resolution. The process is entirely manual, so you're using a pipette tip or an enzymatic dissociation. And unfortunately, there's oftentimes a loss of phenotype and pluripotency because of the manipulations that are required to keep these cells happy and healthy in the dish. Now, when you are culturing IPSCs, everything that you're doing in the lab is designed to maximize viability and happiness in a culture dish like this. So you have highly confluent cells that are growing as sheets or monolayers, and the cells are pretty happy at this stage. But if you manipulate them or you want to clone them or edit them, the very first step is going to require you to dissociate them up off the plate and turn them into a homogeneous suspension of either aggregates or single cells. Uh, this process is then going to be further compounded by turning these cells into single cell suspensions using a technology like a droplet dispenser at low pressure or a fluorescent sorter or even manually limiting dilution. And again, you're decreasing your level of cell happiness here as you continue to manipulate these sensitive and fragile cells. And ultimately, with any of these technologies, what you're left with is a single IPSC alone in a well in a large volume of media that's trying to recapitulate that happy, healthy colony that you've originally started with in a dish. So throughout this entire continuum of trying to develop your IPSC models, you're sacrificing viability as you move along this spectrum. So today I'm going to talk to you about our technology, which is the cell raft array. And one of the ways that we think that we are able to overcome this viability de decrease is by the consumable that we use, which is uh, shown here in the top of the slide. Uh, using the cell raft array, we're able to enable a flask like culture environment while also allowing for single cell spatial segregation. So the cell raft array is available in multiple formats. It's incredibly easy to use. So if you've ever seeded a standard tissue culture dish, the form factor of the array will be very familiar to you. And most importantly for this conversation, uh, the cells all share a contiguous media volume within that central reservoir. So as you can see in the cartoon, when you seed your cells into the cell raft array, they're all sharing a media volume, allowing for crosstalk between the cells and overall better viability and survival. But here's the key. 
Within that reservoir, we fabricate thousands of individual elastomeric microwells. So the microwells themselves provide spatial segregation for your cells, and that allows us to culture thousands to tens of thousands of cells in a single consumable, and yet each cell is individually segregated within a microwell. At the bottom of each microwell is fabricated an is a fabricated a magnetic polystyrene cell raft upon which the cells can attach and grow. So your cells seed into the array, they settle passively onto that growth surface where they attach, and they'll remain there for the entire duration of your culture period. So you can see a cartoon of that here in the top right. The cell is attached to that polystyrene cell raft, but all of the cells within the array are sharing that contiguous media volume, allowing for that increased viability. So I'm going to pause here for uh, poll question number one. And now I'm going to talk to you more about our cell raft technology and how it actually works. So how we use this cell raft array to enable your IPSC workflows. This is a broad overview of the workflow in a nutshell. The whole process starts with our consumable, the cell raft array, where you seed your IPS cells. You can then perform image based software guided selection of your cells or colonies of interest using the cell raft air instrument shown here in the second panel. Using our proprietary software cell raft cytometry, we can look at every single cell raft in the array and determine exactly which rafts contain your colonies of interest. And then after you have identified those rafts containing your cells of interest, we can automatically retrieve them with the air instrument to allow for outgrowth of your selected colonies for your downstream applications. So to talk to you a little bit about more about each piece in this process, I'm going to introduce the cell raft air instrument now. It's a fully automated benchtop instrument, which allows you to perform bright field and three color fluorescence automated imaging of the array. We can perform a full array scan of the consumable in as little as six to 10 minutes in four colors. And we are able to capture an image of every single cell raft within the array every single time, allowing for very discrete imaging of the entire consumable over the course of your experiment. The magnification is done with 10X and a 10X objective, and we are then able to use all of those images to perform in-depth software analysis to identify cells of interest. So uh, as you can imagine, if we're seeding tens of thousands of cells, uh, if you're going to look at the array as a whole shown here in cartoon, you can imagine that there are thousands of cells for you to interrogate and nobody wants to do that manually. Um, and so our software is really going to help you in this process. So if you had a marker, for example, uh, with red fluorescence and green fluorescence, and you were looking for those cells that express both, the software is going to let you do that and very clearly delineate which rafts contain cells of interest. It does that by using advanced bright field analysis. So all of our analytics are rooted in bright field, meaning if you don't have a label, you can do all of your analytics fully label free, which is particularly beneficial for sensitive cells like IPS cells. The analysis software is fully offline, which means that it completely frees up the instrument. So it's very good for large labs or core labs or doing lots of experiments in parallel, because even though you're doing all of your analysis, you're not tied to the instrument computer like you would be with other technology. Using cell raft cytometry, we're able to identify uh, unique subpopulations of our cells. This is fully user defined, so you can decide uh, what your cells look like in terms of shape, size, morphology, marker expression. And then and what I think is probably the most unique feature is that we can actually create subsets of all of these user defined populations in order to find exactly the cells that we're interested in. So you can see here in the image uh, shown in the box, in this particular Venn diagram, we're looking for single cells at time point one, cells that divided at time point two, and confluent colonies at time point four. And that's shown here in the green intersect, which allows us to easily and quickly identify the cell rafts that meet our desired criteria. Once we've used the software to find those clones of interest, we can rapidly map them for isolation on the air system. So what do I mean when I say isolation? Uh, using the air system, we can perform fully automated cell raft release and transfer to 96 wall collection plate for downstream analysis. So how do we actually get these cells on the cell rafts out of the array and into a collection plate? And that's really the magic of the system and that elastomeric feature of the array itself. So there's three main components of this process. The first is the array itself, which I've already introduced to you. 
Uh, during isolation, your cells remain on the raft during the entire process. So you have a nice, happy, healthy colony that's attached to the polystyrene growth surface. We don't trypsinize, we don't scrape, there's no fluidics involved. So that's incredibly gentle, particularly on sensitive cells like, inter like pluripotent stem cells. Uh, the next component of this is the release needle. So there is a release needle positioned on that 10X objective, which sits below the array on the stage of the instrument. Uh, this needle is able to actuate through the elastomeric floor of the array and release those rafts. So when we fabricate them, the rafts are fully releasable and retrievable simply by dislodging them mechanically with that release needle. And then lastly, uh, there's a magnetic collection wand which is positioned above the array. So the collection wand is able to pick up those cell rafts because as I mentioned previously, they've been doped with magnetic nanoparticles. So the wand can pick up the rafts and then transfer it to your downstream collection plate. To show you what this looks like in motion, you can see what this looks like in the cartoon here. So once you've identified the rafts containing your cells of interest, the needle will poke through the array floor and dislodge that specific raft. The magnetic wand will dip down into the fluid, retrieve the raft, move it over to the collection plate where it is deposited into collection media for further outgrowth. So as you can imagine, this is very gentle, it's very quick, and your cells will then passively grow off the raft to attach to the floor of the 96 wall plate. Or you can isolate them into lysis buffer or other uh, lytic buffer for downstream endpoint analysis if you're not trying to grow colonies. <clears throat> Uh, we've been able to demonstrate a really broad cell line compatibility with the technology. So we've characterized over 80 cell lines on the array internally at cell microsystems, ranging from primary cells to adherent cells to suspension cell types. And for the purposes of the rest of today's webinar, I'm going to focus entirely on induced pluripotent stem cells and organoids. Uh, importantly, we've been able to show that we can use the air system to enable all of the workflows that you might be familiar with uh, doing with your IPS cells, ranging from expanding the clonal populations on the array to characterization for phenotype or pluripotency to differentiation into 3D tissues or organoids, as well as reprogramming uh, differentiated fibroblasts into pluripotent stem cells. And I'm going to show you a little bit of data on all of these um, about how we've been able to adapt these workflows to our technology. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, growing iPSCs and developing clones from them is very challenging, largely for the reasons I mentioned before, for viability purposes, for clonality purposes. It's really challenging to uh, find a single iPSC that's given you a colony that you care about. Uh, the air system makes this very straightforward. As you can see in the bright field images on the right hand side, we've been able to do this with uh, four different iPSC lines internally, as well as with uh, many of our customers. And very easily, you can track and trace the generation of your clone from a single cell to a colony quite quickly. And you can see that in each of these images here at time point one, we have a very nice single iPSC that's very easily visible at time point one. And we can follow the maturation of that clone throughout the growth period. Importantly, because of the number of microwell positions that are available to us, we're able to screen over 60,000 individual iPSCs per consumable, which amounts to around 500 times more cells than your traditional 96 well plate. So we're able to screen lots and lots of cells in a very small footprint, which really increases your chances of succeeding in these clonal workflows. In addition, because the array does not require a ton of media or coding, we're also able to uh, use any coding that you might be using in your lab in your current workflow. Um, in this case, we're showing cell in here laminin from stem cell technologies, uh, but it's compatible with these codings and also you're going to use a lot less per cell screen. So on the array, we're using a thousand times less coding uh, per cell screen. And the same goes for your media. So um, because the, so the volume is static on the array, and you don't have to change the media a whole bunch of times, you're able to use 2,000 times less media per cell screen on our consumable. So it's very efficient. We're able to generate hundreds to thousands of clones very quickly. Uh, importantly, we're also able to streamline one of the most important steps in IPSC development, which is pluripotency characterization. And we can do that directly on the array prior to isolation. As you can see here, uh, there's a bright field image of one field of view in the cell raft array containing dozens of individual iPSC clones. We're able to live stain for TRA160 directly on the array and able to ensure that the clones that we're picking are actually pluripotent prior to isolation. And that pluripotency is maintained off array as well. 
Uh, as I mentioned, this is a, a high degree of efficiency with this workflow, largely because we're not going to isolate a single cell, as you might be familiar with, with a sorter or a droplet dispenser or limiting dilution. We can monitor that single cell throughout the course of growth. And what we're actually going to isolate is a fully formed colony, meaning that our success rate is going to be substantially higher because we are isolating a fully formed colony and not asking a single cell to recapitulate that entire population. So what you can see here in this image is a clone that was isolated at day six. You can see the raft in the collection plate downstream on day six. And then by day eight, we have a very beautiful pluripotent IPSC clone that's grown off raft with those uh, tight porters that you come to expect. You can see this quantitated uh, in the graph below. Uh, in order to prove the point, we isolated the cell rafts uh, in this experiment at different stages along the growth spectrum. So as you can see, when we isolate rafts containing a single IPSC, the success rate of clonal generation is only around 10%, which is actually very comparable to limiting dilution as shown here in the yellow bar. So uh, even on our system, isolating a single cell of these sensitive cells does not really give you any advantage. However, if you wait until the cells have doubled or quadrupled, or most importantly, formed a nice colony, you can see that very lovely linear increase in efficiency of outgrowth and clonal formation simply by letting the cells stay in situ on the array prior to isolation. So with our system, uh, we get over 90% outgrowth of the IPSCs when we pick at this colony stage versus the single cell stage. So you can imagine how this would streamline your workflows, uh, allowing you to get hundreds more clones in a much shorter time frame. Importantly, we've also recently been able to demonstrate that we can do the reprogramming workflow directly on the array. So this is really exciting for us. This is uh, pretty much fresh off the presses, and it's a really amazing way to uh, create a, a very streamlined workflow from a very difficult and challenging workflow. So if you have ever reprogrammed fibroblasts from uh, normal cells into induced pluripotent stem cells, you're probably familiar with this. But what you normally see after electroporation and reprogramming is a lawn of cells that looks something like this in the bright field. You'll have a lawn of untransformed, uh, untransformed fibroblasts surrounded and surrounding these small uh, foci of pluripotent cells. And then what you have to do is stain with a marker like TRA160 and then mince up these clones with a 28 gauge needle and then transfer them manually using a P200 pipetter. So it's very manual, requires an expert user, and it's pretty inefficient, typically around 1% to 2% efficiency. In contrast, after electroporation, we are able to take that electroporated cell suspension directly onto the cell raft array. And as you can see here, we can uh, see the formation of pluripotent clones directly on the rafts, which is really quite astonishing. And they are, of course, uh, segregated and able to be released and transferred downstream. When we quantitated those TRA160 foci in the six-wall plate and the uh, cell raft array, you can see here in the bar graph that there were around 400 TRA160 foci in the six-wall plate, whereas on the cell raft array, we had over 1,200 rafts containing pluripotent positive um, potential IPSC clones. So the magnitude of this is quite tremendous, and you could then isolate as many of those rafts as you were interested in for downstream characterization and further, um, and further phenotyping. Uh, you can see what this looks like in the bright field images taken on the array. So after we seeded that cell population, we scanned the array on the air system every day for 15 days during that first reprogramming stage. Uh, and you can see here in the top left corner of your screen at day one, the cell raft does in fact contain a single uh, electroporated uh, fibroblast. We can follow the fate of that fibroblast over the course of those uh, 15 days. And as you can see by around day 11, you start to see that very canonical morphology change of the fibroblast from that long spindly fibroblast to a more compact epithelial looking uh, polypropylene stem cell. And again, by day 15, we have a confluent graph with those morphologically different cells. And if we stain with uh, TRA160, you can see that the colony is in fact uh, TRA160 positive. So uh, this is really good evidence that we have a single cell derived pluripotent stem cell clone that we can then take for cell raft isolation and downstream characterization. Now in the traditional workflow, when you're ready to move these clones around after day 15, as I mentioned, you have to do it with that manual pipetter. And what you often see is something that looks like this, which is that the colony that you've picked up, you've got a lot of cells that are not reprogrammed that have made the journey with you, uh, or you have this sort of heterogeneous look to it where there's clearly multiple foci of IPSCs that have survived, 
or if you're not lucky, nothing has survived the transfer at all. In contrast, when we isolate off of the cell raft array, there's that same raft I just showed you. You can see the raft in the 96 well collection plate. The cells are still TRA-160 positive. And in only 11 days, that clone has completely uh, grown off of the cell raft and has formed a massive pluripotent colony um, that is now attached to the floor of the 96 well plate. And importantly, we see those really nice tight borders of the clone with no differentiation in that really nice nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio that's canonical of iPSCs. And of course, uh, we have a plate full of these now, and there are dozens to hundreds of clones that you could further carry a type or characterize for the, the various hallmarks of pluripotent uh, reprogramming. So to summarize the 2D workflows that I've shown you so far, um, importantly, we can track and trace iPSCs from single cell to clone, enabling all of your iPSC workflows. You can characterize, you can edit, and you can reprogram. We can increase clonal iPSC generation by 25, 25 times compared to limiting dilution. We can confirm pluripotency or other phenotypic marker expression on the array prior to clonal expansion, giving you a high degree of confidence that the clones are what you want and eliminating a lot of the downstream bottleneck. And then you can also reduce time, consumables, material, and labor that are required for uh, this complicated iPSC clonal workflow. We're also able to enable uh, 2D and 3D applications, including selling development, reprogramming, and differentiation. I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk to you about uh, the 3D work that we've done with the IPS cells uh, and also setting up Aaron's portion of the talk. <clears throat> So similar to the uh, 2D workflows, the 3D workflows for iPSCs uh, also have their own challenges. Now, if you've ever done any three-dimensional cell culture, uh, you know that they come with a lot of advantages, but also a lot of disadvantages. Uh, and you can see a typical example of a dome type culture of uh, stem cells here on the left, on the right-hand side of your screen. In traditional dome culture, uh, you're plagued by the need for multifocal imaging. The organoids don't sit in the same plane in the dome, so you have to have a high content imager to look at them. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the population, so you can have different phenotypes, different sizes, different shapes, leading to inconsistencies and a lack of reproducibility in your work. There's also inconsistencies in viability. There can be dead organoids, live organoids, and again, that will occlude your results. And importantly uh, for the talk today, uh, you're limited to these sort of pooled readouts, mostly because in a dome culture like this, it's nearly impossible to take out individual organoids at once. So all of those inconsistencies within the population are going to give you data that's difficult to interpret because you're interrogating the entire population as a whole, rather than on an organoid by an organoid basis. Now, the difference with our system is that using the cell raft array, uh, we're going what I like to call outside the dome uh, and using a very novel culture method for organoids. So as you can see here in the bright field image, this is a stitched image of the entire 3D cell raft array. And each green circle represents a cell raft containing an individual organoid. So using the array, because of the segregation of the microwells, we're able to grow and maintain hundreds of individual organoids on a single consumable. Just like with the 2D workflows, we can also serially image the same organoid over time, meaning that we can track and trace the organoids all the way from cell seeding to phenotyping and isolation. And interestingly, we can also phenotypically characterize these organoids in order to identify individual organoids of interest. So that may be based off of size or shape or morphology or marker expression, allowing you to basically create a customized array um, of organoids that meet your desired specifications. So the workflow on the air system looks like this. Uh, we start by preparing our 3D cell raft array, which is our largest array format. The cell rafts are 500 microns by 500 microns squared. We can dissociate enzymatically a lawn culture of iPSCs like this and do a single cell suspension. We then resuspend the iPSCs in extracellular matrix like matrogel, and we seed it directly onto the array and allow that matrix to polymerize on the array. And then the rafts can be cultured in a normal tissue culture incubator. And using the air system, we can perform serial 2D scans to monitor organoid development. And you can see that here on the right side of the screen, where we start from that single cell and we can see a nice organoid forming at the end of the culture period.
So a really lovely example of how this workflow has been adapted to the CellRaft Air System is this work that was done by our collaborators at the University of North Carolina. Uh, they were also plagued by this heterogeneity issue. And when they looked down the microscope at their dome culture shown here on the screen, you can quite clearly see that the population in the dome does not look uniform. And you can see this highlighted in the blue squares and the red squares, where there are different morphologies uh, within the population. So these researchers were curious about what that heterogeneity of the population meant for their particular application. And they were really interested in doing single organoid transcriptomics to parse out the phenotypes of these various uh, organoids. And of course, in dome culture like this, it's basically impossible. So we worked with them to adapt their protocol to our technology. And what you can see here is what their organoids look like grown on the cell raft array. And much to our enthusiasm, you can actually see these different morphologies recapitulated on the cell raft array in our, uh, in our method, including these columnar organoids in red and the cystic organoids in blue. I mean, these are primary mouse gastric stem cells cultured in the intestinals. So they also wanted to compare the homogeneity and heterogeneity of these organoids um, across the two different culture methods. And as you can see in this principal components analysis, uh, it's quite interesting that there is a high degree of heterogeneity, both in the dome culture and in the suspension culture method using the cell raft array. If you look at this data as an aggregate, so the average gene expression of all of these cultures, you can see that there really is no difference in the traditional matrigel dome method versus the suspension method. Uh, so what this tells us is really two important things. One, that our methodology has not fundamentally changed anything about how these organoids are grown, giving a high degree of confidence that these workflows can be adapted to the platform. But also it really highlights the fact that the dome culture is masking a lot of these phenotypes because of that uh, sort of agglomeration of all the organoids in a single sample. So I think this is a really exciting example of how you can learn more about the biology of these organoids by looking at them at the single organoid level as opposed to at the population level. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit to the IPS derived organoids. I'm going to briefly introduce them here, but Aaron's going to go much more in detail about how these organoids are used, particularly the, the neuronal ones. Um, but there's a lot of really important research that has uh, started to come to the forefront using IPS derived organoids in a variety of different fields, including developmental biology, uh, cancer, as well as custom disease modeling for patients with genetic mutations. Today, for the purposes of the talk, we're going to focus on neuronal organoids, and these have been very heavily leveraged in brain development and evolution, cancer research, Alzheimer's disease, as well as stroke research. And these models are incredibly important, largely because these types of tissues are not readily available. So by using these pluripotent stem cell derived models, you can create better models in a dish for studying drugs or toxicity or, or cancer development. So Aaron's going to tell you a lot more about this protocol uh, that they've developed at Stem Cell Technologies, but um, just broadly speaking, when you're creating these neural organoids from iPS cells, it's a very uh, regimented process requiring lots of different media changes, moving the organoids around from different plate types, as well as culturing them in shaker plates. Um, and so this is a very involved and lengthy experiment that requires a high degree of dexterity for the researcher to make sure that you get reproducible results. And the kits are amazing and they go a long way towards uh, simplifying that for you. But we were really curious if we could further simplify that research by collapsing the workflow onto the cell raft air system. So using the uh, stem diff kits, we wanted to see whether or not we could do all those media changes and all of that differentiation and maturation of the IPS cells directly on the system. So to do that, we seeded IPS cells uh, in the, our extracellular matrix suspension that I've already described, and we performed all of those maturation steps directly on the array. So uh, embryoid body formation, neural induction, expansion, and ultimately differentiation directly on the, on the system. And in that do it, in so doing, we're able to follow the differentiation of these organoids uh, all the way from single cell to mature organoid. Uh, and so uh, we did this experiment with uh, two different edited IPSC lines that we co-cultured. One was edited with an RFP, one was edited with a GFP. And if you look at a cross section of the array at one field of view, you can see something that looks like this. So just like in the regular dome culture, you see that heterogeneity of your population. There are red organoids, there are green organoids, there are red and green organoids. 
But the beauty of the air system is that you're actually able to parse out those differences and look at each raft on an individual basis. So I, I love this picture. Um, every time I see it, it, it blows my mind uh, that you can actually look at a raft containing a single red IPSC, a single green IPSC, or a red and a green IPSC that have seeded down together and watch the formation of embryoid bodies that are either red, green, or a chimeric red and green organoid. So I think you can uh, easily start to imagine the universe of research that would open up to you if you could create custom organoids that you could then pick out on an organoid by organoid basis to do very specific testing for mutations or drug discovery um, at this single organoid level. Now, of course, the nice part about the air system is that we don't make you do this by eye. The software will also help you here, just like it helps you in the 2D workflows. We're able to use our cell raft cytometry software to uh, identify cell rafts containing single IPSCs on the day of seeding. We can then use the software to define characteristics of organoids that we are interested in at different time points along the spectrum. So what I'm showing here are organoids that are between 100 and 300 microns in diameter at day 10. And we can create an intersect of those two populations to find our single IPSC derived organoids shown here in the uh, intersection of the Venn diagram in green. Our single cell organoid efficiency on the consumable is over 17 percent, uh, which is incredibly high. And we are able to generate hundreds of organoids per consumable. So you can see that quantitated here. Using the Cerebral kit, we have over 200 rafts containing single organoids, and roughly a quarter of those are single cell derived, if that's your workflow and that you care about. With the Cori Plexus, the numbers are very similar, around 250 uh, rafts containing single organoids, as well as about a quarter uh, of them single cell derived. So you can uh, sort of picture what it would look like in the lab to generate 96 well plates, each containing a single raft with an organoid of choice. If you are not interested in isolating, you can also perform all of that differentiation directly on the array itself. Uh, in this particular example, we took those red edited IPSCs and we did the entire Cori Plexus differentiation directly on the array. We weren't interested in um, necessarily expanding these, but we wanted to see whether or not we could characterize them using the imaging on the air system. And as you can see, there's a single or a IPSC here at day zero. We can perform all of those media changes I told you about directly on the consumable, uh, limiting the amount of manipulations that you have to do for yourself. And then we can follow the differentiation of these organoids into mature Cori plexus. And you could also interrogate them with drugs or other, um, other stressors on the array, just like you would in any other plate. Uh, we've also done this with the stem diff cerebral organoid kit, trying to differentiate them into cerebral organoids. And again, Aaron's going to talk to you a little bit more about this in a moment. Uh, but what you can see here is a single green uh, IPSC at day one. We can do the majority of the expansion on the array at day 10. And while the organoids are still small and round like this, we're actually able to isolate them and transfer them to a downstream collection plate. So what you're seeing here is that same organoid that was isolated and transferred over to a collection plate. And then it was isolated directly into the differentiation medium. And you can see the formation of these beautiful and really quite amazing neural networks as the organoid continues to grow. And these will grow out to day 60 uh, or day, even day 75 uh, in the 96 well plate without any decrease um, in isolation, of, without any decrease in viability. So uh, essentially what the air system is going to allow you to do is create custom IPSC organoid plates for your cell-based assay work. And I think this is really quite tremendous and an ability that you won't have using a lot of other technologies because you can essentially create a custom array of whatever organoid is important for your research or your disease of choice. And uh, you could imagine the applications that this enables, whether it's single organoid transcriptomics, drug screening, toxicology, or even creating custom patient-derived organoids for disease-specific models. So I'll leave you with this question. How would a full plate of fully characterized single IPSC derived organoids enable your breakthrough research? What could you as a scientist do with this that you can't currently do in your own lab? And I would love to hear from you um, how you can imagine using the technology in your own research. <clears throat> so I'll pause here for poll question number two. 
And uh, with that, I'm going to conclude my section of the talk. I would like to thank two incredibly talented scientists on my team who are responsible for all of this work. Uh, Lexi Land has done all of the two-dimensional IPSC work, and Alyssa Stern is responsible for all of the 3D work. And then our collaborators at uh, the University of North Carolina, Jared Blyton and Scott Max. Uh, so with that, I really appreciate your time. Um, we at Cell Microsystems are very passionate about helping you adapt your workflows to our consumables and our platform. So uh, I would love for you to reach out to me and kind of tell me what you think uh, and how our system could help enable your research uh, in the lab. Uh, and then you can access our IPSC application note in the resources section of the webinar. And with that, I will turn it over, over to Erin, who will tell you more about the neuronal organoids. So in today's uh, half of the webinar, I'm going to be talking about PSC-derived choroid plexus organoids. Uh, my name is Erin Kanaka. I'm the Associate Director of Neurobiology and Research and Development Department at Stem Cell Technologies. So to start, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what organoids are. Uh, and so as you're probably aware, access to primary human tissue has long been a limitation in basic and clinical research studies. And this is especially true of brain tissue, which is the focus of today's webinar. We're going to be describing one particular in vitro model and its applications. Organoid technologies have emerged as novel models to obtain human tissue in vitro. And this is a method where you have a ball of cells, whether they are pluripotent or primary stem cells, and they're induced to differentiate into neural cells in a three-dimensional structure. So by following developmental patterns, what we end up with is a structure that contains multiple cell types at once. They can self-organize into the structures that you would find in the brain. And that, that uh, structure of cells recapitulates the functions of the brain. So by virtue of having neural precursors, neurons, astrocytes, all present and arranged roughly how they are in vitro, people have found that organoids contain more mature neurons with activity that can actually mirror some of the aspects of what has been recorded uh, from, from uh, fetuses using EEG. So as such, organoids have been utilized in understanding organ development and function and disease mechanisms. So based on how we defined an organoid, we highlight here how these features are essential to certain disease modeling applications that you want to use organoids for. So with organoids containing multiple cell types, this has been really useful for things like studying viral infection where uh, particular cell types are susceptible to infection and certain cell types may not be. Uh, and this has been used for things like Zika virus, herpes simplex virus, and even more recently, SARS-CoV-2. Looking at the structure of the cell type in the organoids, researchers have been able to study diseases such as microcephaly and macrocephaly, which result in smaller or larger brain size, respectively. And this is easily observable in an organoid system, which results in smaller or larger organoids compared to the control. There, additionally, there's a distinct form of schizophrenia, which has been shown to change how the neuron layers are formed within the cortex. Now, finally, the functional electrical activity of neurons in an organoid system has been shown to develop mature functional neural networks, as I had previously mentioned. Um, and you can use the organoids to study that activity and how it matures over time as well as looking at even more complex systems such as cultures with uh, muscle tissue to form a neuromuscular unit and seeing how the action of the neurons can exert control over the muscle uh, in the neural organoid combination. So taken together, I hope it's easy to see how useful organoids can be for a whole variety of, of different types of disease modeling. So a quick word here on a recent paper that outlines some guidelines for how we refer to different types of organoids. In this publication, the leading researchers involved in developing all of these organoid systems uh, have agreed that we can broadly class organoids either into unguided, so no signals directing the differentiation, or regionalized with brain region specific signals directing the differentiation. A regionalized organoids are then named after the brain region that they represent and on what types of cells you can find in that organoid. Further, when you start to co-culture organoids together or with other cell types, we refer to these as assembloids. And if you were to inject uh, organoids or assembloids into an animal model, they're then referred to as grafted or transplanted organoids. So this slide also gives you a peek into the types of complex cultures and applications that people are now starting to think of when they're using organoid technology. 
Uh, well, organoids are certainly really cool. They do come with some really unique challenges, particularly with the reproducibility and the standardization of protocols, how you handle and analyze these large and complex tissues. Uh, and so that's been shown a little bit uh, in some of the previous portions of this webinar, but in my portion, I'm gonna talk about uh, how we at Stem Cell work to standardize protocols across cell lines using quality reagents. On this slide, I'm showing the various guided, unguided and regionalized organoids that we could produce using our stem dip kits. Our guided organoid kits can help you produce dorsal and ventral forebrain regionalized organoids and are based on Sergio Pasca's technology. We have an unguided organoid kit based on Madeleine Lancaster's protocol, which produces an organoid with mixed lineages, though predominantly neurons and glia of the cerebral cortex. Now, finally, the focus of my portion of the webinar today are the guided choroid plexus organoids that were developed by Laura Pellegrini from Madeleine Lancaster's lab. And if you're interested in further protocols for the culture of organoids, you can scan this QR code and find them available on our website. So for the rest of my section, I'll be introducing you to the choroid plexus and its function, why you might want to use choroid plexus organoids, and some data on the performance of our choroid plexus organoids. Now, the choroid plexus is found deep within the brain, lining the fluid-filled ventricles. It's composed of specialized cuboidal epithelial cells, as you can see in this diagram. These are also called ependymal cells, and they're technically a type of glia. Although they have epithelial characteristics such as apical basal polarity, cell to cell junctions, and cilia. The ependymal cells are surrounding, uh, uh, surrounded by a capillary system and stroma. And the ependymal cells are joined together by a series of tight junctions to form the blood cerebral spinal fluid barrier. And this barrier prevents free passage of molecules from the systemic circulation through the blood into the CSF. So it limits the transport of things from the blood into the brain. The choroid plexus also contains an immune cell component, uh, which is macrophages, and it's considered a gateway for immune cell entry into the brain. Developmentally, choroid plexus epithelium is derived from the ectoderm germ layer, and it arises from regions in both the hindbrain and the forebrain. Now, as I've alluded to previously, the choroid plexus has two main functions. First, it secretes the cerebral spinal fluid into the ventricular space. Uh, the cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, has an important role in physically protecting the brain by cushioning it. It also functions in waste removal, nutrient distribution, and it can be thought of as an additional sort of brain circulatory system. Finally, the CSF contains hormones, and proteins, and extracellular vesicles, which impact cell signaling and have an important role in brain development. The second major function of the choroid plexus was, uh, as I've already mentioned, is that it forms this blood CSF barrier. Now, this barrier prevents contact between the blood system and the CSF. However, important uh, components for uh, the central nervous system function, including water and ions and proteins and metabolites and nutrients, may be selectively transported across this barrier. Also, I noted earlier that there was an immune component of the choroid plexus, and the CSF blood barrier uh, contains resident macrophages in it and dendritic cells, and these cells express uh, MHC molecules one and two. Now, there are a number of reasons why scientists may wish to study the choroid plexus in vitro. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to access the choroid plexus in vivo. Uh, and there are lots of different choroid plexus related human pathologies that includes things like choroid plexus tumors, as you can see in the, the middle picture on uh, the right hand side of the screen. Uh, and these are a relatively common type of infant brain tumor and they account for 10 to 20% of all infant brain tumors. Hydrocephalus is another common uh, dysfunction of the choroid plexus, and it's an accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid in the ventricles, and it causes a lot of increased pressure on the brain, and you can see a picture of what that looks like uh, on the right at the bottom. Now, because the CSF is involved in exchanging components with the brain tissue, it's a rich source for brain biomarkers. So for example, increased levels of phosphorylated tau protein in the CSF has been identified as a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. However, the process for obtaining CSF from humans involves a lumbar puncture or, or commonly known as a spinal tap, and that's very painful and invasive. 
Now, aside from biomarker discovery, scientists may also be interested in using the Cori Plexus uh, model to study uh, the barrier dynamics of the blood CSF barrier uh, and looking at the in the context of drug delivery, what kind of drugs can enter into the brain environment that they want to, or conversely, uh, drugs that should not enter the brain environment that they don't want to. Now, historically, in vitro models for the Cori plexus include two-dimensional cell culture of either primary choroidal epithelial cells, mainly from mice, as you can see on the picture on the left, uh, and then venturing into a sort of more two and a half dimension transvol systems that are shown on the right. And these are really popular because it allows you to plate your core plexus epithelial cells on this transvol and model really the barrier function uh, by examining what crosses from one compartment of the transvol into the bottom compartment of the transvol. And you can see two different um, iterations of that in this picture. However, all of these previous models really poorly recapitulate uh, Two, the two main functions of the Cori plexus barrier, which is not only the barrier, but also the CSF secretion properties. And so to have a, a model that can model, uh, or an in vitro model that can do both of these things uh, was why Cori plexus uh, organoids were developed so that we can have human relevant models that recapitulate both the secretion of the CSF and the barrier function of the human Cori plexus. So to accomplish this, Laura Pellegrini and Madeline Lancaster uh, working off of the stem to cerebral organoid uh, protocol that they had previously developed, they added patterning factors that guided the differentiation of those organoids towards a predominantly choroid plexus lineage. And that's shown in this publication on this slide. These organoids, unlike earlier models, demonstrate choroid plexus barrier function. They have selective transport of molecules across the barrier. Uh, and you can see some uh, cartoons demonstrating that uh, on the right. Uh, the cells in the organoid secrete CSF-like fluid into cystic structures, which are separate from the culture medium. Uh, and I'm not going to show all the data from this paper, though I will reference uh, some of the figures later on in the talk as we compare the performance of our kit uh, to what's shown in the publication. So based on this publication, we developed the stem diff cord plexus organoid kit. It's a serum-free culture system consisting of two basal media and six different supplements. And the kit generates cord plexus organoids from human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. The resulting organoids consist of ependymal cells generating fluid-filled cysts, as you can see in the pictures along the top, uh, and that recapitulates the barrier and CSF secretion functions of the cord plexus. Now, basal medium 4 and supplement I are used in the final stage of the protocol, which is maturation. Uh, and these two components are also available separately as the stem diff cord plexus organoid maturation kit for customers who wish to extend the maturation period beyond uh, day 30 or day 40. So I'm gonna walk through uh, some of the different uh, features of these organoids along this protocol. And on this slide, I'm showing day 30 organoids from four different cell lines, two embryonic stem cell and two iPS cell lines with this characteristic cystic morphology. We have about a 70% success rate with cyst formation across all of the six cell lines that we've tested. However, there's still some line to line variability in terms of how many cysts are formed and how big those cysts are. And you can see that represented in these pictures with the WLS1C line uh, showing sort of fewer, smaller cysts and lines like the, the RO38s showing larger cysts. Now on the right, I've also included some of the representative organoid images from the publication for reference. Now the dark mass in the center of the organoids often contains four brain type neural tissue and that's composed of mainly of neurons which I'll show a little bit more detail in a few slides. So here are some life size images of how those fluid filled cysts can develop in size over extended culture from day 50 to 85 to 102 as shown on the right. On the left, you can see a close up of the cell morphology with those epithelial like cells that line the cyst with this very cobblestone appearance that you would expect from Cori plexus epithelium. Now these pictures are immunochemistry for transthyretin TTR in green, which is expressed in Cori plexus epithelium, but not in neurons, as you can see below in the cerebral organoid. And MAP2 in purple, which is expressed in neurons, as you can see in the cerebral organoid on the bottom, uh, but not so many cells are expressing that in the Cori plexus epithelium, as you can see on the top. 
Now, on the right, I am now uh, showing you how we've confirmed this uh, increased expression of choroid plexus markers uh, by qPCR with the expression of transthyretin uh, on the top uh, being higher in the choroid plexus organoids marked in red, and then the lower expression of neuron markers like MAP2 uh, in the choroid plexus, as you can see on the bottom. Now, another marker that is highly expressed in choroid plexus epithelial cells is CLIC6. And you can see that here in red, and these are again, whole mount images of the choroid plexus organoids. So you can see how CLIC6 overlaps with uh, TPR expression in green uh, here at day 50. And then again, uh, by qPCR, you can see the increased expression of CLIC6 in the red dots representing the choroid plexus organoids compared to the blue dots representing the cerebral organoids. Uh, and then you can also see in this image below how that compares to the images from the publication, looking at uh, surrounding assist in, in this time a section through the organoid where you can see the overlap of CLIC6 and TTR along the edges of these cysts. Now, one of the features of this model is that now you can interrogate the fluid inside these cysts to study the secretion and the barrier properties of the choroid plexus. So you can see from the plate image on the left how easy it is to identify the cysts. They can be pretty large. It allows you to sample the fluid using a few different extraction techniques. So in the middle, I'm showing you a basic method, a little cartoon diagram of how we use to extract the fluid with a syringe. Uh, and then you can see on the right some images of how clear this fluid looks compared to the smith spent media that the organoids were cultured in. So at least we know that things like phenol red don't cross that barrier. So once you have the fluid extracted from the organoids, uh, we can usually get about 100 microliters from an organoid with large cysts like the one shown on the previous slide. And then there are several ways you can go about analyzing it. So here on the left, I'm showing some Western blots for clusterin and IGF-2 uh, indicated by the red arrows in the extracted fluid compared to the spent and fresh media, as well as the lysate from the residual tissue. So not the cystic tissue, but the other tissue. And there's clearly an enrichment for these two proteins uh, that are both commonly found in the CSF, in the cyst fluid, but not in the media, indicating that they are contained by the epithelial barrier. On the right, I'm showing uh, a picture of some mass spec data where we're looking for either the presence or absence of certain uh, proteins in the fluid. And so the presence is indicated in orange and the absence is indicated in white. Uh, and you can see uh, the presence of several uh, proteins in the cystic fluid, including as a, uh, previously shown IGF-2 and clusterin in our organoid derived CSF, uh, particularly compared to the spent culture medium. And then I've also included uh, a sample of the adult human CSF uh, as a reference. And we're still going through this data. And if you want to know more, you can uh, contact us about it. Now, another way to test the function of the cysts is by looking at the barrier permeability to different compounds. So here I'm showing an experiment where we added a 3 kilodalton fit c conjugated dextrin to the media around the organoids for 16 hours. And then we assessed the fluid from the cysts and looked at the media uh, for green fluorescent signal to see if the dextrin had crossed the barrier. Now, the tighter barrier, the, the less likely small compounds like this will get through. So as you can see from the graph, when we take a cross section, you can see that uh, represented by the, the black dotted line through the organoid and look at the fluorescence intensity uh, compared to the media baseline, which is represented by the red dotted line on the graph. With uh, just the normal organoids cultured with the FITC dextrin, we don't see a, a high amount of fluorescence within the center of the organoid, um, although around the edges you can see a little bit. And when we add uh, EDTA to the media for two hours, this loosens up uh, the, the gap junctions and allows the fluorescence to get in, as you can see represented in the picture. And when we quantify that, you can see how the, the fluorescence has now increased uh, within the, the inside of the organoid. So finally, what you can do is to show that these uh, barrier that we've got formed in these organoids uh, express selective transport receptors and will allow through into the cyst compounds that are known to cross the blood CSF barrier while excluding those which we know are not able to cross. And a classic example of this are dopamine and L-dopamine. So you can see from these figures from uh, Pellegrini et al. that while both compounds can be detected in the media, only L-dopamine, which is known to be able to cross, can be detected appreciably in the cyst fluid. Now, corresponding to that, the choroid plexus epithelium from these organoids 
express selective l dopamine transport markers as shown on the bottom, uh, including LAT1, as well as other selective drug transporters like uh, PGP, MRP4, and MRP1. So to sum up this section, the stem diff choriplexus kit can produce cystic organoids with high efficiency in expressing the expected choriplexus markers. The cysts are filled with a fluid containing proteins that are known to be present in the CSF and form a tight barrier through which even small molecular weight proteins can't cross. And this makes choriplexus organoids a fantastic new model for studying questions related to human CSF and the human CSF barrier. And thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Thank you very much, Erin and Jessica, for that very uh, informative presentation. So it's now time to move on to our Q&A session. If you do have any further questions, you can still submit these now in the box to the right of your screen. Um, so to kick off the Q&A, our first question is, can this software be used for any type of stem cells or is it made for iPSCs specifically? And I believe this question is directed at Jessica. Thanks, Georgina. That's a great question. The software is adaptable to any cell type that you want to use on the cell wrapped error system. That's really the power of the software and why it's such a great tool. Because all the characteristics are totally user defined, uh, you can use it to set any characteristics that are important to you for any cell type that you're using. And it also makes the error system very versatile um, because as I mentioned, we've used it for our, um, over 80 different cell types ranging from adherent to suspension to primary, and you can create custom parameters for each of those. So yes, it's absolutely adaptable for any cell line that you're growing in your, in your lab. That's great, thank you. And another question for you, Jessica. Um, they have asked, do you think this would be useful in looking at drug treatment in stem cells or is this more targeted towards cell line growth and differentiation? Absolutely. It could definitely be adapted for a drug treatment or response. Uh, we've uh, had some customers do those workflows before, either directly on the array. So if you're looking for drug sensitivity or resistance, you can do that on the platform as like a cell-based assay and isolate clones that respond one way or the other. So kind of linking phenotype to genotype. Um, alternatively, you can create a custom 2D array of your cells, just like you would uh, with the 3D arrays that I talked about. So if you were doing drug screening on a broader level and you wanted to pick uh, an established established iPS cell line into a 96 well plate to do um, you know, multi-time point or multi-dose type drug discovery, that's absolutely possible as well. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned being able to separate the cells to observe phenotype. Would we be able to extract the cells from the dish to see genotype changes? Yes, absolutely. So you can do that again one of two ways. You can either isolate directly off of the cell raft array into a lysis buffer. So rather than isolating into a 96 wall collection plate, you can isolate into a PCR plate or PCR strip tubes into lysis buffer. So if your endpoint is lytic, you can certainly isolate into a lysis buffer or um, other type of assay buffer. Or if you're looking for clonal expansion or, or you've edited or something like that and you're trying to look at genotype downstream, you can always um, let your clones grow in the 96 volt plate. And then once they've grown off the raft and they've attached to the floor of the 96 volt plate, you can do whatever you like with them downstream. So again, it's very adaptable to other technologies that you might have in your lab, whether it's a library prep system or a plate reader uh, or something like that. You can certainly use the clones that you generate to do any other downstream analysis that suits your workflow. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we've got time for just one more quick question. So that is, is there any possibility of cross-contamination using the same magnet bar? And this is for Jessica again. Uh, that's a great question. We get that question a lot. Um, no, the, obviously I'm never going to say no to anything, but um, the possibility is really, really slim. The cells stay very tightly attached to the raft, just like they do to any other polystyrene growth surface. Also, the transfer time on the wand is really quite low. So the, the dwell time for the raft is about five seconds from a pickup to touchdown. So the possibility of transfer is really, really slim. Um, and we've also tested this extensively uh, using what I call a checkerboard experiment, where we isolate different phenotypes of cells uh, into collection plates in sort of a mixed pattern. And we don't see any cross-contamination during that transfer period. So the likelihood is really, really slim. 
Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, so unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. So I'd like to uh, thank our expert speakers again, Erin uh, and Jessica, for today's very interesting and informative presentation and discussion. And a big thank you to everyone joining us online. We hope you found this a worthwhile session. If you do have any further questions, please feel free to email me at editor at selectscience.net and I will follow up with your questions for our speakers. Remember, you can download related resources in the tab to the left of your screen. And and this includes the certificate of attendance. If you'd like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in just a few days time. Goodbye and thank you once again for joining us.